Beatrice Chestnut, welcome back to the new school. Thank you for hosting this Enneagram Day here, this Enneagram series. Well, as you know, Beatrice, I am a, a profound admirer of Enneagram studies. I've been immersed in them for perhaps the last three or four years. I know that's not much. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, there's that saying uh, that to become expert on something, you need 10,000 hours of practice. Right. And uh, I don't... I don't have anything like that, so I'm still a newbie. Well, perhaps in the way you immerse yourself, maybe it's only 4,000. <laughs> I don't think so. I think it's... I think Social it's fives may have a different scale. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well... Uh, Maybe that's true. Naranjo was a five, right? Yeah, yes, social right. five. Yeah, yeah, social five, yeah. Um, but I uh, was saying earlier that um, I've been studying psychologies, plural, for 50 years, um, and uh, archetypal psychologies uh, profoundly for the last uh, 20 years. And uh, each of them have really contributed to my understanding, but I've never found... Uh, an archetypal psychology that yields uh, such depth of understanding of myself and other people as Enneagram. And uh, I love its ancient roots. Uh, I love its um, <coughs> rebirth and contemporary form. Um, and uh, you are simply among the most profound interpreters of Enneagram that I have read and found. Thank you. So it's a great joy to, uh, after our first conversation here, which is among the New School podcasts that people can find, um, it's a great joy that you agreed to do uh, three day-long workshops on all nine Enneagram points. Mm -hmm. So with that, welcome. Mm -hmm. uh, we are in front of a, a community of many of your mm -hmm. students and followers and many of our friends from the Commonweal community. Mm -hmm. And uh, with that, I turn it over to you for a, an introduction to what we're going to do over the next three days and today in particular. Great. Thank you so yeah. much, uh, Michael. It's so wonderful to be here at Commonweal. I think it's a really natural partnership between your mission and what you do and what I, I'm hoping to do with the Enneagram and certainly what the Enneagram is all about. Um, so thank you. Thank you. It's, it's a, this is the perfect setting for this. Um, so I, what we're going to do with these three days, this three-day series, is basically learn about the Enneagram types, uh, the nine types, and also uh, something about the 27 subtypes. Uh, we may not have all 27, but we'll be close. Uh, through the panel method, the narrative panel method, which is learning about the type through hearing from people of that type talk about their experience of their type in everyday life. Um, and we'll be asking them, how do you see your type show up? Uh, and so instead of me telling about types that aren't mine, you know, I, I know type two really well from the inside and I can speak a lot about that. I can speak about the other types as an outside expert, but not, not as an inside expert. And so we'll be hearing about the types from people who are educated self-observers who have been really doing Enneagram work uh, for, for a, a, a long period of time uh, and so are accustomed to noticing uh, the patterns of type and how they play out on doing the inner work uh, that the Enneagram is all about to really see how those patterns play out, try to be more conscious of them um, so that they can grow and become uh, more self-aware and and transform, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and so the panel method is something that was originated by Helen Palmer and David Daniels. Uh, and I think that school of uh, Enneagram teaching is now going by the name the narrative school. Uh, and Helen and David were really pioneers in uh, kind of putting forth the idea that this is one, really one of the best ways to learn the Enneagram is uh, hearing it from people who live it every day. And now, so, David Daniels uh, passed away recently. Yeah? He did. He passed yeah. away last year. Yeah. And he taught this at Stanford. He did teach it at Stanford uh, quite a long time ago now. He and a Stanford professor taught a course there. Yes. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. He was a Stanford-based psychiatrist, had a private practice in Palo Alto where I grew up, which is mm -hmm. how I came to know the Enneagram through him because I knew his son. Uh, but yeah, he was definitely uh, one of the really world-class foremost teachers of the Enneagram and especially known for his uh, warm, uh, warm approach, his uh, depth of knowledge, and uh, his brilliance in facilitating Enneagram panels. Mm -hmm. um, certainly watching him facilitate Enneagram panels, like helping people's story come out, helping invite people not only to tell their story of how they see their type uh, on display in their life, but also how to use that information and that self-observation to grow, um, how to understand what their blind spots are, how to understand uh, what uh, what direction they might grow in and how what they might need to understand about themselves to become more of their higher self. Now, there are many forms of psychological typologies. Clearly, Enneagram is one of many. Mm -hmm. um, the, um, you know, Myers-Briggs is another example of, yeah. there's this five-factor personality. Um, mm -hmm. The big uh, five. Yeah. The big five approach. Um, I was actually looking at that last night, uh, and I thought, you know, this is interesting, but it doesn't seem to me to yield very much information. I mean, you know, I can't remember them all right off the bat, but there's neuroticism, openness, you know, five mm -hmm. different. But you look at that and it doesn't yield a lot. I mean, Myers-Briggs, which is based on Jung, you know, an uh, eightfold um, uh, characterization, that yields to me a great deal more. Mm -hmm. um, but say something about the the different strands of Enneagram work. So for example, there's the, you know, the Gurdjieff, Ichazo, Naranjo spread out through Berkeley strand, which is the one that you participate in. Um, but then there's, um, there are the people for whom the mystical origins and uh, the kind of inner deep work is, doesn't interest them at all. They're using it for organizational development, um, things like that. Mm -hmm. So uh, if one were pro to, if, if one wanted, and you've actually done this in one of your books, if you wanted to demystify Enneagram mm -hmm. for a broad public who weren't interested in its origins, mm -hmm. uh, how, would you, uh, how would you describe it? I would say it's a tool to enable, facilitate, uh, enhance self-observation and self-awareness. Um, one of the ideas behind the Enneagram is, uh, and certainly behind a lot of psychological approaches, including mm -hmm. Freud, is that we all have an unconscious. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's things that we do, that we, ways that we are that we're conscious of and that we know about, but then there's a lot that we're unconscious about. Mm -hmm. Uh, we all have blind spots. And the Enneagram is a very objective map of uh, nine character styles and their patterns of thinking, feeling, and behaving. And so by uh, highlighting uh, the specific nature of these patterns, it's almost a guide for self-observation. It's a guide for developing greater self-understanding and self-awareness uh, with the idea that the more we understand about ourselves, uh, the more ability we have to intervene and shift our patterns if they're not serving us. Right. You know, one of my favorite little memes about the origins of Enneagram um, is um, that the Enneagram, uh, according to some, uh, tracks almost perfectly with, uh, with Kabbalah. Uh, mm. uh, it tracks... Yeah virtually perfectly with the seven deadly sins of Christianity plus two they lost along the way. <laughs> yes, yes. Uh, but then here's the one that totally blows me away, and you uh, present this in your wonderful book, The Complete Enneagram. The Enneagram tracks perfectly with the lands Odysseus visits on his way home from Troy in the same order Right. As the Enneagram. Right. So to me, what that says is that there are lots of personality typologies, yeah. but in the Abrahamic faiths and in the Greek Hellenistic tradition, there are these nine character types mm -hmm. that have been recognized 
for 3,000 years, right. you know. And to me, that is astonishing. It's, uh, you me know, too. I like old tr things. Me I'm too. Just somebody who me too. Me too. Traditions. I love history. Yes. Yeah. 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 And so, I mean, yes. and yeah. when I read that, let me ask you this. Where did you discover that um, the Enneagram tracked uh, 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 the uh, lands Odysseus visits on his way home from Troy? Well, um, uh, in probably about 15 years ago, a little more than that, there was a guy in the Enneagram community, Michael Goldberg, who he mm. actually wrote a book about working with the Enneagram in business. Mm. I think it's called The Nine Ways of Working. Um, and he was doing workshops on the Odyssey, and he even wrote a little book <laughs> called Travels with Odysseus. And interestingly, he doesn't mention the Enneagram in that book. Mm -hmm. um, however, he does kind of make the... Uh, the lessons of the Odyssey, the characterizations of the nine lands in the Odyssey, he makes it, he kind of simplifies it for, and, and it suggests that these characterizations can be used for understanding ourselves. Uh, and so I went to a workshop that he did and I thought, wow, that's incredible. Now, I don't know that he discovered it. I know that he had talked to Achazo a lot, so I don't know if that came from Achazo. I, I'm not exactly sure where he learned it. Obviously, it's there, and, and mm -hmm. I give him credit uh, for highlighting that and bringing it out right. in, in his teaching. And I and I thought, wow, this is incredible. So mm -hmm. I went and read the Odyssey, which I hadn't read before, even though mm -hmm. I was an English literature major. Uh, <laughs> it later got me interested in reading the Divine Comedy, you know, the other kind of oh, epic I should have mentioned that. masterpiece. It yeah. tracks closely with Dante's circles. Yes, well. it's not a one-to-one -one correspondence yeah, yeah. that's so neat, like in the Odyssey, but yeah. it's there in yeah. different ways. Yeah. And it makes you wonder, did Dante know either the Enneagram itself or something like it? Yeah. And of course, the Enneagram was passed down in secret schools for many generations, yeah. for probably maybe thousands of years. It only really surfaced in the form that we know it uh, in such a clear way in the in the last century. Mm -hmm. So Gurdjieff is credited with having brought it to the West. Yes. Gurdjieff never taught it explicitly as a theory of personality. He used it in movement work. Right, right. He, he, he taught about the symbol. Yeah. Um, so we know a lot about what we know about the power of the symbol and the incredibly deep meaning behind the symbol and a little bit about where it may have come from. Um, he did talk about th uh, three types. You know, he called them man one, man two, and man three, which we can see as the body-based types, the heart-based types, and the head-based types. He did talk about that. He didn't talk about the nine types. Um, some, some authors think that he didn't know the nine types. I think he knew but didn't talk about it. <laughs> That's just yes. my theory. I can't prove it. Mm -hmm. Um, but he did also um, talk a lot about sort of a program of self-work mm -hmm. that he connected to the three centers of intelligence um, and to chief features, mm -hmm. which was his name for the, what we would call the passions. Um, right. Yeah. But did he acknowledge more than uh, uh, mm -hmm. three chief features? He acknowledged, uh, I believe, nine chief features. So yeah, yeah. really, he he didn't actually, I think, talk much about what they were. Right. He did talk about how every person has a chief feature, yeah. and it's really good to kind of poke someone in a certain place right. to he, help them he would grow. Imitate a rooster strutting around. To yeah, make something fun like of that. Yeah, that something. would be a yeah. good example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 And, but he was a lot about sort of the path of, of inner work and that it's very challenging and, and that we often think we're farther than mm -hmm. we are and a lot about um, uh, sort of what that entails and some about where that came from. You know, it's so interesting. The classical Gurdjieff people sort of uh, poo-poo or dismiss uh, the Enneagram <laughs> yeah. personality. But if yeah. you look at, uh, for example, Helen Palmer, uh, she acknowledges Gurdjieff yeah. in her work. And mm -hmm. uh, she, by the way, wrote a beautiful quote for your book, mm -hmm. uh, um, uh, just saying this, that, that, you know, the complete Enneagram, the title is, is accurate and right. And mm -hmm. she's so grateful that your research, um, I mean, that's a very strong statement from yeah. Helen Yeah, Palmer. she's been very yeah. good to yeah. me, yeah. very generous. Yeah. 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 And also, uh, you've, you've done many remarkable things in your work, but, and forgive me if this is wrong, but, it seems to me that your greatest innovation is a reinterpretation of how the arrows work, the internal arrows. Could you say a word about that? Sure, yeah. I, I think uh, 
you know, of course, the symbol of the Enneagram is a very potent symbol. We know that from, from Gurdjieff. Uh, one of the aspects that he mentioned was that the symbol needs to be seen as in motion. Yeah. Um, he said a a, a, an, a, a, an Enneagram that's not in motion is a dead symbol, is what he mm -hmm. said. Uh, it simply needs to be seen in motion. Um, and so the arrow lines are a suggestion of the fact that, that, that everything is in motion, you know, going back to Heraclitus said that, um, and that in a way being in personality, identifying with a personality and not realizing that you're much more than your personality is in some way a way of unconsciously staying stuck in one place and not moving with the flow of life. Mm. You know, life brings us challenges for us to flow and move. Uh, and the Enneagram maps that if you know what your main type is, you know what your path is, and you have an arrow that goes against, you have an arrow that comes toward your main point from another point, and an arrow that goes toward another point from your main point. Uh, and those are very meaningful, just like the movement of the Enneagram is very meaningful. And uh, my teaching partner and I, my, my teaching partner, Urani Opias, um, has done a lot of studies in the Gurdjieff work and also in Sufism. And so we together, kind of at the same time, uh, kind of had this idea, we really need to in interpret the arrow lines in a very specific way to help people understand how they can use th the symbol and those arrow line points for growth because those are really, really important uh, access points, uh, balancing points, kind of antidotes for the main type. Uh, but we, so we have a specific way that we talk about that that we hope will people will find clarity in, so that they can understand how exactly to use those points uh, to grow. So, for example, as a five, um, uh, in conventional interpretation, <clears throat> in the heart space, I go to eight, and my challenge is seven, right? And uh, your approach is to call the movement to eight child heart, right? Right, right, that yeah. That you're going back to deal with issues that you hadn't completely dealt with in childhood. Right, right. And that seven, the movement to seven, is actually the growth direction. Right. Right, which I find to be true. I mean, it's very, you know, I... Um, I'm good one-to-one. -one. I'm good when I have work to do in front of an audience. But if you put me in a cocktail party, mm -hmm. I am want to get out of there as mm -hmm. fast as I possibly mm -hmm. can. And, mm -hmm. and the idea of just being with people together in ordinary life, enjoying ordinary life, is hard for me. You mm -hmm. know? And so uh, your interpretation makes a lot of sense. And I think it's important for people to know this innovation of yours, because it it quite dramatically affects how one interprets Enneagram. Yeah, yeah, yeah. and I, I think it's the next step of work after you've done a lot of work really understanding your main type mm -hmm. and understanding what the growth challenges are there and what to self-observe in yourself. You know, I, I do suggest that people start with really a thorough understanding of their main type, but after you've done that for a while, I think mm -hmm. these arrow line movements are really important. And one of the things we emphasize the most is that you need to do the work uh, at the point against the arrow first. Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, there is a particular order that needs to be followed, otherwise the work isn't as sustainable. Um, so in other words, you as a five, you would really focus on working on the eight point first. Oh really, I didn't know that. Me as a two, yeah. I, would, I really needed to focus and need to focus on doing the work at the four point mm -hmm. first before I do my work going to eight. Now, when I go to eight, if I haven't done my four work, <laughs> Any change that I might be able to to bring about at eight isn't going to last because I haven't had the stable grounding at four. And it also suggests the Enneagram is a little bit like a time machine. Uh, and so going back against the arrow is a little bit like going back in time. Like you said, there are often things that weren't allowed in childhood. Maybe your, your family system or the culture sort of told you, no, you can't go there, or there wasn't room to go there, or it was you got punished if you went there. And so it sort of needs to be reclaimed, reintegrated in a conscious way uh, and so that you can sort of uh, balance out the self utilizing those resources of the healthy side of that point. And then that helps you integrate at your main point and then sort of make the trip forward into the future uh, and, and toward the point with 
which is challenging. Mm -hmm. It brings up a lot of defenses. It's been called the stress point. Um, and so it, it, it is stressful by definition, but it's a good kind of stress, mm -hmm. a kind of stress that challenges you and invites you to grow in exactly the ways that you need to grow. Mm -hmm. That feels true for me. Uh, I want to try something on you that I've never talked about publicly before, but um, in uh, the New Testament, uh, the story where uh, Christ is uh, confronted with the woman who had uh, slept with more people than people thought was a good idea. And, uh, I love the way you put yeah. that. <laughs> and um, and um, the uh, the rabbis come up to him, and or the, the Jews, I don't remember if it's the rabbis, come up to him and say, uh, should we stone her for her sins? Mm -hmm. And so what does Christ do? Let he, he who was out. No, wait, but, <laughs> yeah, 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 no, wait, before yeah, yeah, that, yeah, yeah. he leans over and he draws in the sand. Mm. And then he says, let him who is without sin cast. I'm wondering if he drew the Enneagram. You know, because just I like think that. about it. I, I like that Just hypothesis. think about it, yeah. you know? Because, you know, yeah. Enneagram has your sin and your virtue, right? That's right. So what and it has the different kinds of sins. Right, yes. and so he leans, and, and not only that, wow. not only that, mm -hmm. but Gurdjieff once said, and he was deeply Christ-centered, if you were alone in the desert mm. and you drew the Enneagram in the sand, mm. you would know everything you needed to know. Right. Yeah. So I wonder if this is an original interpretation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I like it. I like it. I'll say that. Yeah. And it would make a lot of sense. Yeah, yeah. It would make a lot of sense. I mean, those traditions we know mm -hmm. are very ancient. And Jesus wasn't trying to start a new religion. He was um, trying to deeply interpret the religion he had, which was based in uh, Kabbalistic wisdom, you know, right, right. which uh, exactly, as we know, mm -hmm. uh, models the Enneagram. And That's so, right. you know, uh, uh, anyway, these are profound issues. Yes, and Gurdjieff also said the Bible is written for, was written for those who know. Mm -hmm. Yes. So yeah. it's, it's written in code, mm -hmm. just like the Enneagram is mm -hmm. a kind of a encoded system mm -hmm. for mm -hmm. all this knowledge. Now, there are many Enneagrams, right? In other words, there's the Enneagram of personality. Uh, how, do you, how do you think about the other Enneagrams other than the Enneagram of personality? Well, I think about the Enneagram, and, and, I, and true, I went through an Eureka training with Oscar Achazo's group, and... They talk about the Enneagram of this and the Enneagram of this and the Enneagram of this, and I think it's true because, but I think of it in two different ways. I think of the Enneagram as a typology, as this personality typology, and then I think of the Enneagram as, as process, mm -hmm. um, as steps in a sequence. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what the Enneagram really is. It's not only something that teaches us about our types and other people's types and how we're interconnected and how we can use knowledge of psychology and spirituality to grow that in the way that it's encoded in the Enneagram, but also it's a map of process. It's the steps needed to take. So one, at point one is not just type one, it's the first step in a process or the first note in the octave. Mm -hmm. uh, as Gurdjieff's talked a lot about um, the law of seven and the law of three coming together and the law of one in the Enneagram, um, it's very much, and a lot of the, the Sufi tradition, a lot of ancient traditions that, that teach about the Enneagram or that where you find the Enneagram are a lot about that are a lot about how can you understand the steps of transformation uh, that it, that's also encoded in the Enneagram. Mm -hmm. And it, it, it's a map of the hero's journey. Uh, it's a map of this, uh, you know, how we come, how we fall down from consciousness when we come into a human life and how we take the trip back up to spirit. Mm. Yeah, Age Amos's uh, Enneagram of Holy Ideas is such mm -hmm. a beautiful text. Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, so um, we're going to start the panels soon. Um, this is so rich. Um, I, what else would you like us to know before we start the panel? Well, I guess I would just say that um, the main point of the Enneagram, the main use of the Enneagram is for growth. Um, so when we do the panels, there will be a little bit about just helping people understand, especially people who are new, what is this type all about? What do they pay attention to? What are their patterns? 
what are their strengths, what are their challenges. Uh, but then we'll also really ask about really the main point is how has the knowledge of your Enneagram point type helped you grow? Mm. Uh, and so there's, there's necessarily always a focus on um, using the Enneagram as a way to see your personality patterns, to see your shadow, so that you can break out of that and reach your higher potential. In, in my book, The Complete Enneagram, I use the metaphor of the acorn and the oak tree. Um, it, it, the acorn needs to drop into the ground and have the shell break open in, in order for the oak tree to emerge. And that's the whole idea. So I guess mm-hmm. I would just say that. And I just uh, want to also appreciate our panelists because uh, it's such a rich learning, but it comes through them their willingness to share, uh, in some cases, uh, very important and profound experiences with us. Uh, and I think it gives us a very efficient and, and quick window into uh, the, this, this system that's actually very complex. Uh, but by hearing people tell their stories, by hearing different people tell the same story all together in different ways, um, I think it becomes a very rich teaching. And that's both... Uh, interesting and educational, but also deep and profound and in some cases very magical. I also want to thank the panelists for being willing to have this recorded and disseminated through the New School because these are personal stories. And so we're grateful for people sharing in that way. Yes, yes. And thank you for organizing this again because I think this can be of value to a lot of people who maybe can't travel to a workshop live but would like to get access to this teaching. Wonderful. So thank you, Beatrice Chestnut. And uh, with that, we'll uh, take just a moment and have the panelists uh, come up. And from there, you will take us forward. Great. Great.